RPA PAL is sponsored by an educational grant from Amgen, and we appreciate their support. Finally, be sure to check the RPA website for upcoming webinars and events. I will now turn this over to our moderator, Rob Blazer. Okay, folks, I'm just getting in here. Excuse me. Welcome to everybody. We are lucky to have three of the most uh, dynamic and together nephrologists that I know on this panel right now. First, Nishant Jalahandra comes to us from Fort Worth, Texas. He's a general and interventional nephrologist there. A very involved in his community, especially with teaching residents at Medical City Fort Worth Medical Center. He's a R- member of the RPA board and on, on committees with the Texas Medical Association. Dr. Catherine Kwan is a partner at Lake Michigan Nephrology in St. Joseph, Michigan. In her practice, she's expanded clinical services to include home hemo, CRRT, and a hypertension specialty clinic. And she's passionate about helping nephrologists thrive in private practice and in using the power of the online nephrology community to help all nephrologists offer state-of-the-art care. She's also on the RPA board and the ASN Continuing Professional Development Committee. And Dr. Gary Singer is a founding partner of Midwest Nephrology Associates in St. Louis and an assistant professor of clinical medicine at Washington U School of Medicine. His responsibilities also include a medical directorship with Fresenius, and he's a member of the ABIM Nephrology Board. He's also very involved in the online nephrology community and a member of the RPA Board. Believe it or not, that was not their entire bios. You can see those online. They, ha- they do a bunch of other great stuff as well, so you want to check that out. So, uh, Steve, I assume I have control of the slides here. Oh, there we go. So before, uh, before we get started with the text, we're going to do a poll. And this is an easy one. Did you use telehealth before the current crisis? Give you a moment to answer here, and we'll check out what the answers are on the other side. Okay, well, there you go. 90% did not use telehealth before the current crisis, so that just goes to show you um, how, how profound the change has been over the last few months. Um, so presumably, this will let me control the slides. There we go. Now, you all know that I couldn't be involved in presentation without doing a lot of the talking myself, even though I'm only the moderator here, but the idea was that it would be good to run through the policy changes, past, present, and future in telehealth, so um, I'm going to do that now. And previous to, uh, the, previous to the pandemic, to the public health emergency, a lot of services provided by nephrologists were already on the allowed list, and you can see the list of codes there, E&M codes, everything in dialysis, except the, with, with the one exceptions, um, kidney, KDE codes, tra- transitional care management code, advanced care planning codes. However, the originating site and geographic restrictions prevented their common use. Now, this is kind of the joke in Washington was people would celebrate when they got a code added to the, uh, to the approved telehealth list, but the originating site and geographic restrictions made it kind of a Pyrrhic victory because it would only apply to 15% of the country. So everyone would say, yeah, we got it done, but it kind of laughed at themselves like it doesn't necessarily have that much to do with delivery of care. And there were also HIPAA concerns about secure technology. You know, they, they, they had to make sure that, um, that confidentiality was being um, was being uh, observed, and people couldn't hack into somebody's medical records. And then, of course, COVID came, and the world turned upside down. Uh, the originating site and geographic restrictions were lifted, and in my opinion, this was the sea change that changed everything. Once they did that, um, it, it really it really affected everything. So virtually every E&M code was added to the telehealth list, including the new patient codes. And this was a big deal. I was getting a lot of calls about, well, what about new patients? And uh, CMS did that. I don't think that was in the first wave of changes. I think that came about two weeks later, but they made that change. The restrictions on what technology you could use, patient cost sharing and patient consent were also waived. The telephone only codes are now allowable and it took them a while to get to that. And I will tell you that I talked to CPT people, old experienced hands who thought that would never happen. But of course, you know, in the the era of a pandemic, you kind of had to. And eventually they also, a couple weeks after that happened, they added payment parity with the established patient office visit codes that you see there. So big, big changes in terms of telephone only codes. However, audio only telehealth is still not allowable. So there's a difference between telephone and telehealth. Telehealth infers audio visual being available. 
and telephone is audio only, so they are not interchangeable. I got that question about 10,000 times in the course of the, uh, in the early days of the pandemic, and that's what it is. The limits on state licensure were temporar temporarily waived. So if you're in, say, West Virginia and you have a patient in Virginia, I think before uh, one of the parties had to go to the other state to make this work, and that's not the case anymore. A lot of people think that's something that might happen permanently. And the policy revisions are going to be applicable until the conclusion of the public health emergency, unless dot, dot, dot. Um, you know, uh, I'll talk about this more later, but I, that's probably going to be extended. So um, we'll see what happens with that. But I believe we have a, oh, one more slide. Um, RPA did a telehealth survey in May. It was open for about two weeks. You can see the results here. I'm not going to read everything here, but um, but it was interesting. 74 respondents of uh, did not use telehealth prior to the public health emergency, which it's interesting to compare that to what was in the the poll at the start of the presentation, about 90% of the folks um, uh, on the webinar here. So, uh, you know, the historic pattern of dialysis patients receiving care in the in-center setting uh, rather than home dialysis was reflected. Um, of course, it grew exponentially during that time. It, number of physician-patient interactions held steady. Um, it seemed as if most people in terms of either the originating site or how the dialysis facility handled um, the telehealth interactions was uh, uh, either average, above average, or excellent, and there has been a significant migration of CKB care to telehealth-based interactions, and you would expect that, I think. Um, now we're up to the second poll, and this is where are you using telehealth? Please check all that apply, and you can see the, um, the, 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 the place, places of service there, so um, I'll stop and let the poll come up and let people answer that. Well, there you go. Uh, nobody not using telehealth. I find that interesting. CKD care, that's a little higher than what we had in our survey. And you can see the complete survey results on our website. Um, uh, home dialysis, that, that sort of makes sense too. The in-center number is higher than I would have thought, but I'll bet there's still a lot of monthly interactions still happening on a face-to-face -face basis. With that, I'm gonna close that and move on to the next slide and introduce Dr. Kwan. Um, I'm trying, Steve, I'm trying to advance this and it's not letting me do that. There we go. Dr. Kwan? You're still muted, Katie. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you today about the lessons we've learned from our telemedicine setup. Since everybody seems to be using it, I don't need to go into a lot of details. Um, but we moved very quickly uh, as a small independent practice of just two people. Uh, we needed to get telehealth up and running pretty quickly. Uh, Steve, if you put up the photo for just a little bit longer, I can talk about um, our setup. But basically, we bought cheap iPhones uh, so that we weren't giving our phone numbers out. And we decided to use FaceTime and Google Duo. Um, we looked at integrated applications with the EMR. So that's my office computer in an exam room, and next to it is the iPhone on a tripod, and I've got a Bluetooth headset. Um, we contrasted that with the experience with the hospital-owned practices in our practice area. It took them a couple of weeks to get an integrated web development um, app up and running, and the feedback from my colleagues is that that has been uh, pretty bulky and a lot of a um, lot of technical glitches. Our existing computers did not have cameras, um, so we didn't want to buy all new computers. Uh, and the iPhone setup let us use FaceTime and Google Duo pretty quickly. Patient response has been great, and I think that's something that we're really going to want to keep um, moving forward. Is the ease of use for the on the patient side is very very important. Um, I think it's unrealistic to ask seniors to download a lot of specialized applications. Um, so we've had a lot better luck using ones that are already on their existing phones. Thanks, Steve. I think that's enough of a picture. Thank you. Um, it's important to note that the CMS waiver that allowed for Google Duo, FaceTime, and Skype did not declare those applications to be suddenly HIPAA compliant. They are not HIPAA compliant. Uh, but what CMS has said is that for the duration of the public health emergency, um, making a good faith effort to use those 
is not going to trigger an audit or a violation. Um, when the public health emergency ends, and that's by declaration, uh, we will have to uh, stop using those unless CMS takes steps to sort of enshrine those as now allowable technologies. Uh, the patient experience, I think, is really going to drive a demand for telehealth in the future. Um, we live in uh, Michigan. It's very cold at times and the roads get really slippery. Um, and I, it's hard to imagine uh, seniors and patients having to get on the roads uh, in a blizzard or cancel their appointments uh, when they've got a cell phone and we've got a cell phone and we can just quickly migrate to a telehealth visit uh, when needed. I think another benefit that took me by surprise was doing nursing home visits. Um, so patients uh, in the nursing homes that are referred for CKD care, uh, it's been extremely helpful. Uh, those are you know, debilitated patients. They really actually suffer uh, with the transportation to our office. Um, and having the nursing home staff, the nurse there, able to access their records and answer questions uh, when the residents themselves might not be able to do so has been really an enhancement of those visits. Um, so lessons to carry forward. I think simplicity and flexibility is key, both for the patients and for the practitioners. Um, talking to an iPhone screen that's set up right next to my monitor allows me to do telehealth in my home office or in my exam room. Um, and on the patient side, again, we heard again and again, this is so much easier than the app that the hospital may be download. Um, I think that what's going to drive making these changes permanent is patient demand. They love this service. There's a lot of uh, safety and convenience, um, and it's hard to imagine this going away forever. I think the last thing is that we need to be mindful that the existing digital divide is going to exacerbate healthcare inequalities, and that in part of um, advocating for these technologies for our patients, we need to be mindful that they're not available to everybody, um, and that part of advocating for our patients is making sure that solutions are in place that ensure that care inequalities aren't made worse. So I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing my colleagues talk. All right, thanks to you. Um, thanks, Katie for the wonderful update. So this is uh, Nishant from Fort Worth, Texas. Um, good morning and welcome. So I'm gonna jump right in. This is my landing page for my website. So when we launched telemedicine or telehealth, our biggest concern was how to make it easier. Uh, there are a bunch of platforms that we looked at. We didn't want to tell patients to go to this website and then click there and then click on that website. And so we, Wanted, our goal was to make it as simple as possible. And why our landing page? I'll get to that too in a minute. So we told patients to go to one website, click on the very first big orange button that you see, they click on that and they directly go and get connected to start the telehealth visit. So simplicity was the key. The next topics that I want to reach is before we started or implementing this, we had to run through a few sessions within our staff we are a very small practice, so me and my medical staff ended up running into a lot of different issues to set up with policies and procedures, which if you don't have, make sure you have policies that would state as to how you're gonna do telemedicine, what it would entail, what it would not entail, what you can do, you cannot do. Uh, consents are a big requirement, so you need to have a consent from the patient saying that you, they have consent and view for the telemedicine. Um, so that, is, that was another requirement that we had to update our consents, send them out to the patients uh, ahead of time so that they can be signed and be ready. The workflow that we implemented was the day before the visits. My One of my MAs would call all the uh, patients and do all the chart preps, meaning all the labs are in there, whatever needed to be done was done, and everything would be nice and ready. The patients would get a message to confirm their appointments and they also, in this, on the same day, if the patients did not log on to for the televisit, then my MA would call them and tell them, hey, you're running late. Um, would you want to carry on with the visit? Then please log in so that we don't run behind and make it, make it easier. 
the day after the clinic, the MAs would again call the patients and follow up on everything that needed to be done, which is to make the follow-up appointments, send out all the meds, all the lab work, and all the care plan as what was discussed so that the patients can follow through that care plan to understand what exactly happened. The day after the visits, we also ended up capturing a lot of data, meaning that we had to keep a log of how many patients were seen on telehealth, how many were not, why and what not, just so that we knew as to what really was happening. This was also a requirement because we had, uh, we took the loan from the government for our small business. And so to we had to justify a lot of the expenses that we had incurred and what we did in terms of this COVID pandemic. The few benefits that we saw was obviously our goal was to keep the volume and maintain the census, which we, we were not able to do it at 100% level from before, but we maintained to keep it quite good. Um, the care and continued care for the sick patients, a lot of patients were CKD4, CKD5 who needed or blood pressure tweak that needed to be done. So those things were, was really helpful that we could continue with that care. The last part was before all of this happened, we were struggling with getting our website to be more pronounced in the, in the internet domain. So when this happened, the reason why we chose our landing page was because we wanted to boost our Google SEO results and, and um, presence. So we thought, well, if patients by default go to our own website, that would help our Google SEO. Um, so what we did is, we tracked our website utilization. And as you can see that as more we had, we went from about 10 visitors to our website over a weekly duration to about 600. And we had all these unique visitors. So now everybody, anybody who Googles my name or my practice's name, then we will by default show up on the, on, on Google maps or on google.com as, as our website is used more and more. Uh, so that was one of the biggest benefit that we saw out of this telehealth. Uh, but more importantly, caring for our patients and giving them good care was, was our main goal. The biggest drawback that we saw while implementing this was a lot of our patients in rural Texas still are on flip phones and they don't have smart devices in their house. And so unfortunately, those patients, we had a lot of hurdles capturing them into using telemedicine. So we, we did not, for about two months duration, have any in-person visits into our clinics. But last week, we have started doing some in-person visits, which is only one person at a time. And they sit outside in the car till they're called, just to make sure that we don't, we don't miss out on those sick ones who, on which we could not do any televisits. I think that's the end of it. And I'll pass it on to Gary to carry forward. So hopefully you can hear me. Uh, this is very simple. This cartoon demonstrates some of the limitations, however, of telehealth. This lady's saying, good news, Lloyd, it's your remote health doc. He says it's your gallstones, but he can Photoshop them out. So I'd like to have Steve play a short uh, video clip, which will also demonstrate some of the challenges that we've been experienced with implementing telehealth in our particular patient population, Steve. Dad, don't you see the link? I'm looking right now. I don't see it anywhere. Are you looking in your text or emails? Text. I emailed it to you. Do you see it? Oh, okay, I see it now. But it's not doing anything. Did you click on it? No. Okay, go ahead and click on it. It's saying it wants access to my microphone and camera. Click OK. Are you in? I think so. It says it's using my computer's audio? That's good. Can you see me on your screen? No. Are you looking at your computer? Oh, okay. There you are. Okay, I'm going to hang up the phone now.
I can hear you, but I can't see you. Do you have your camera on? I think so. I don't think it's on. Why would it not be on? I can't see you. That means it's not on. Well, how do I turn it on? And why can't we just talk on the phone? We'll be able to see each other on a big screen this way. Now there should be a camera icon on your screen. Just click that. I don't see one. Just move your mouse. One should appear. What's it look like? A camera. It should be in the lower left side of your screen. Got it. I finally found okay. it. I can't hear you now. I think you hit the mute button. Okay. Can we go to the next slide? So this has been, for the most part, a positive experience. And uh, what I'd like to say is that we're fortunate that I'm a, a small practice. I'm one of four nephrologists and Katie's one of two and Nishant is one of one. And so we've, I think, been relatively fortunate that we can change and pivot, so to speak, when things arise. Uh, during the Q&A, it'll be interesting to hear how larger practices have adapted to uh, the public health emergency. And so we saw in early March, actually the second week of March, we saw appointments start to plummet. Uh, the guidance uh, that things were gonna change in terms of Medicare coverage for telehealth came out on March the 17th. We knew that we were gonna have to implement telehealth and we looked at our uh, EHR and our EHR has a module. However, it would require uh, patients to download an app, have an active account, and implementation of that would have been uh, fairly uh, cumbersome and not very easy for us or for our patients. And so we ended up adopting a third party platform, uh, which at the time was doxy.me. For some reason, there's a black, a black thing on my screen that's obscuring the slide, so hopefully you can all see it. Now I can't see the slide at all. Let's see. Uh, so we chose doxy.me because it was HIPAA compliant, it could be customized, and we could implement it immediately. And so what we ended up doing is uh, on March the 18th, we signed up for doxy.me, and then the following day, one of my partners in clinic started using it to see patients virtually. Um, something that's also important is to make sure that you are covered in, uh, from a liability standpoint and that you have appropriate consent forms for patients. And we contacted our liability insurance carrier and that made it uh, fairly easy to do. Uh, in addition, we created specific telehealth uh, visit types within our EHR and smart phrases documenting that the visit was being conducted by telehealth using doxy.me and subsequently a different platform, which I'll mention. And then we also uh, documented that we uh, obtained consent and furthermore, because we had applied for the PPP loan, uh, we uh, created a code so that we could uh, track cancellations that were purely on the basis of COVID. So for example, during the month of April, we had over 75 patients cancel and not reschedule purely on the basis of the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, and so what we found with doxy.me is that it worked, but in my experience, it didn't work consistently. Um, and so one of my partners noticed that the doximity, I'm not sure if somebody else is unmuted, but doximity, which is sort of a LinkedIn version uh, for uh, physicians, I'm not sure if anybody else has used it, but doximity was uh, piloting a video uh, call uh, app within their uh, app. Uh, we view, I've used doximity in the past predominantly to phone patients uh, and it shows them my office number as opposed to my cell phone number. Uh, with doximity video calls, it's very simple. The patient receives a text message. They click on the text message link. They enable their uh, microphone and their camera and you're off and running. And it also recently uh, adapted a, a nudge function so that if the patient doesn't log on immediately, you can call them and walk them through it. And with that, we've had uh, excellent success. Um, and both uh, all the providers in the practice have been using uh, Doximity exclusively in the office. And uh, go to the next slide, please. In terms of uh, virtual visits, we what we saw in terms of our, of our visit volume, initially our volume was down to about a third of our normal volume, similar to what Dr. Perlmutter had said earlier. Um, and the majority of those visits were done virtually. Um, we uh, 
in our office building, which is connected to the hospital, everybody who entered the building was screened both with a temperature check and a symptom survey. Um, and that was done until the beginning of June so that patients who had any symptoms or fever were turned back and sent home. Uh, we required uh, everybody to wear a mask. Uh, very few patients came with anybody except themselves unless they were very debilitated and everybody in our office wore a mask. Since June the 1st, we've had signage outside the door of our office uh, requiring a face mask. Um, and uh, we also do screening, including temperature checks on everybody. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide looks at the pros and cons of telehealth. And I think some of these uh, uh, issues have been raised by uh, both Katie and Nishant. But I think uh, some of the benefits uh, to this are that we can have a wider catchment area and we can also provide care to people who are in more underserved areas. The uh, problem with that is a lot of people who live in those underserved areas don't have access to fast, reliable broadband. Uh, many patients of mine, surprisingly, don't even have cell phones and those who do have flip phones. Uh, so that uh, has been an issue which I think will need to be addressed going forward. Um, Obviously, uh, this will allow fewer no-shows. Um, and so right now, we've benefited from this uh, sort of payment parity, so to speak. Uh, but I think there's gonna be probably more discussion about payment equity, uh, because it's generally, uh, at least the way we're doing it currently, less expensive to see patients uh, via telehealth. And uh, going forward, I think it might be a, a perverse incentive to see more patients using telehealth. And so I think that's something that will probably need to be addressed. I think what we can also talk about is with the new payment models, utilizing telehealth visits may definitely uh, allow us to provide uh, more efficient care uh, and keep patients out of the hospital. Um, in terms of the security concerns, obviously the waivers have allowed us to use various uh, non-HIPAA compliant platforms. And I highly doubt that that's gonna be uh, allowable after the uh, pandemic is over. Um, and then at the bottom, I talked about revenue and sort of we can definitely increase our revenue with telehealth. But again, I think that's something that's gonna have to be addressed going forward because I think we don't wanna uh, encourage sort of excessive uh, visits uh, via telehealth since it's uh, being paid at a higher level. Uh, next slide. I think that might be my last slide. Okay. Steve, you're up. Or uh, Rob, actually. Okay, so first a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, when I have my camera off, you're seeing a picture of Mrs. Blazer and our dog, and I think that's a good thing for all of you because then you don't have to look at me. Um, secondly, um, uh, Gary's email kind of, or, or excuse me, Gary's video kind of hit a little close to home because in that situation, I'm the dad and Steve Hardy and Amy will confirm that. But anyway, slide 16, we have, a, we have another poll. What platform have you been using most frequently for telehealth since COVID be began? I'm not going to, um, I, I, I'm not going to read all of these and I'm noticing that there's not an option for other. There is one group that's using one touch. Um, but anyway, there's, there's the list and why don't you go ahead and complete the poll and we'll move on. Rob, we've got some black boxes over all the slides. No, I know. I see it too. Um, not sure what to say about that. Um, I can go ahead and read my last slide. It's about the future of telehealth. So um, uh, actually, let's finish the, the poll here. People can see the majority, it seems to be our doxy me. Um, however, there's also uh, FaceTime is also high and Doximity is high as well and Teams. So 0% um, people not using telehealth. The next time uh, we will get all the options in there as noted in the one comment in the chat, I believe. Okay, so we've, uh, we've talked about what was happening before, the changes that got made and all of our nephrologists told us how it worked in their areas. So what's gonna happen next? Um, the expectation is that the public health emergency is going to be concluded fairly soon, 
Now, you know, I did do this slide, uh, you know, a, a week or so ago, and everything's blown up in the south and southwest and west. So maybe this will be recalibrated. But the idea was that the public health emergency was going to end sometime in July. It was a date out there of July 24th at one point. Some people think it'll go through the end of the month, but we'll see if maybe the administration rethinks that, rethinks that based on um, what's going on in previously uh, unaffected parts of the country or minimally affected parts of the country. You know, everyone's pretty sure that a lot of the provisions are gonna be extended. Um, the, you know, in fact, there was a, uh, an article got tweeted out yesterday where Seema Verma was saying you can expect all of the, um, not all, you can expect that the Medicare fee schedule will include um, uh, passages that are gonna be talking about what they're gonna extend for telehealth. So we'll see what happens there. Um, Congress mostly, uh, the administration and organized medicine seem to be all in favor of extending, uh, extending the telehealth provisions. I can tell you that the American College of Physicians is advocating for everything that's in place now to be in place through the end of 2021. So they're calling for it to be another 18 months before CMS undoes anything. And that is so that they can figure out what worked, what didn't, and uh, you know, adjust moving forward. Now, where it says Congress mostly, the pockets of caution are within, for example, House Democrats. Um, I know there's some concern that, um, that, that they're kind of opening the door to a Pandora's box in terms of fraud and abuse. Um, so they think that all of these waivers, you know, need to be considered very carefully before they're extended kind of ad infinitum. So um, best guess here, and the best guess here is the Rob Blazer best guess, don't, don't attribute this to any, anyone else, but is that the originating site and geographic restrictions are eliminated. And, eliminated. and to me, that's the whole ball game, as I kind of inferred earlier. Um, if they don't eliminate the uh, originating site and geographic restrictions, they might as well not bother extending anything else in my view, because again, it's only gonna affect whatever 15% of the country, wherever the number lands. I would guess that the monthly face-to-face -face visits with ESRD patients and face-to-face -face visits with new patients will resume. Um, and that substantial guardrails are developed in areas such as use of audio only phone codes and HIPAA compliant technology. But I can tell you there is a ton of advocacy going on in favor of um, approving audio only phone codes. So we'll just have to see what happens with that. And with that, I believe we're moving on to questions. Um, Steve, I'm trying to advance a slide and can't. So, um, okay, there we go, questions. Um, and Amy, are you gonna read the slides or would you like me, or the questions or would you like me to? Hi, Rob. Um, I will read the questions that we've gotten so far, um, but if everyone can turn their video back on, and Steve, I think we can close the slide so we can see everyone a little larger. Uh, so just a reminder, you may ask your questions using the Q&A box. Um, first, we actually have a comment, um, someone sharing from the audience, that United Healthcare has moved the end date for telehealth provisions from July 24th to September 20th of this year, just as an FYI. Um, but our first question, uh, which I think all of you can tackle, is we are finding that telehealth creates increased work for the office staff between chart prep, extensive phone conversations, et cetera. Has this been your experience? I guess I can start. Um, we typically call the patients ahead of their visits, and we were doing that in the past just to verify that they had had their labs checked, which they usually do prior to the visit. We will frequently review their medications prior to the visit as well. I think the additional work has been uh, walking them through how to uh, get into the telehealth visit. And I think as more patients are familiar with that, the workload for the office staff seems to be going down. So it really has not, I mean, I haven't had any complaints from my office staff for the most part regarding that. Yeah, I'll chime in. It's absolutely, it's a different workflow. Uh, one thing that we found really helpful was creating a script for our front office staff so that as they were setting up these telehealth visits, they knew to be very specific about which app was going to be used. We had a um, set set of instructions so that they could walk people through using Google Duo or how to answer FaceTime. Um, you know, we, we closed our office for two months and many, most of my staff were either working from home or just at home. Um, so it was doable. 
um, integrating it with a fuller in-person clinic schedule does start to be a little bit of a burden with it, just the amount of phone time. I see a bunch of questions on HIPAA, so I'll try to answer, start on the HIPAA chat, I guess. Um, so I'm not sure if there is any movement in getting rid of HIPAA. So I would not jump into that discussion because it's unknown. But of all the telemedicine options that you see saw on that last question, we're all HIPAA compliant. So if you are not using a HIPAA compliant platform now, it might be a good idea to look into HIPAA compliant platforms if you want to continue doing telemedicine going forward um, in a way that it mostly will depend on what's easier to introduce into your practice, be it uh, doxy.me, which is extremely easy. You can capture patients' photos and for documentation purpose, you can keep a list of who came in for how long the televisits were done. They have different subscription options too. So depending on what platform that fits into your budget, your requirements, your uh, workflow, just go through them and figure out which one is right for you. Um, the few other things that do run into all of that is your state medical requirements. So HIPAA is federal, but you've got to make sure that you follow all your state medical requirements. Um, and obviously that would change from state to state, from time to time, and also your liability coverage. Because if, if you have liability coverage for telehealth, but it is only covered for a HIPAA compliant platform, then that is another thing you want to ask your liability provider right now to say, hey, am I covered if I don't use a HIPAA compliant platform if there was something to happen? So those are a few other technical things that you got to run through and figure out what, uh, what would be the best case scenario to work into your practice. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have another question on, uh, do you think it's a best practice to use telehealth for the initial patient visit? I wouldn't consider it a best practice. I think we're living obviously in different times right now. Um, I think a lot of what you can get from patients, you can get from a good history. I mean but I think the physical exam is definitely important. And I think that's something that really is missing from these visits. Um, I think the patients do, I mean, they do appreciate the FaceTime and the fact that we're going through the effort of arranging the visits. But I think if you're gonna see somebody for the very first time, obviously a lot of it is reviewing data, getting an excellent history, but I think to actually miss the physical exam is an issue given the current climate that we're living in, I think we have to modify that, but I wouldn't consider that a best practice. The one scenario, and I alluded it to, I mentioned it in my talk that I actually prefer it is a nursing home initial visit. Um, I have always felt uncomfortable um, with having patients who uh, may not have the greatest memory sort of be wheeled in on a stretcher to my clinic so that I can review the chart with them sitting there unable to answer questions. I've really enjoyed having a nurse on FaceTime, seeing the patient in their own environment, not putting them through the discomfort of transport. Um, and I think that the limitations of a physical exam done over video um, is really outweighed by the safety to the patient, the comfort of not making them be transported, and the ability to talk to staff, clinical staff, that aren't going to come to an office visit. Great, thank you. Dr. Uh, Jandalar, you have something to add to this? Uh, yes, I mean, there is always a limitation into doing um, telehealth visit on a new patient. And we have had a bunch of new consoles that came in and some were urgent and stat. So, when we were in a total lockdown, there was no other option but to do, do a telehealth visit. And depending on how sick the patient was thought to be, sending them to ER, is that an option? It, that is always an option, but if, if we can avoid that, then we won't avoid that at all costs. So a lot of it dependent on the cost or risk benefit to the patients and, and, and to their family members. The good thing about a tele 
visit was that there were always three family members sitting with the patient. So you can always ask more questions. You'll get more data, unlike a physical visit where you know, only the patient shows up or with a trance with somebody or by themselves. So that I think was a big positive that I saw it was much more family involvement, but there is no right or wrong to that question. Meaning that if the patient needed to be, if they were sicker, then I would schedule a follow-up visit within a week or within two weeks, just so that we keep up with what, what all things are going on with them and, and not uh, miss out on big items. Great, thank you. Um, I'd just like to note, we're getting several suggestions for other HIPAA compliance uh, platforms in both the chat and the Q&A box. Um, so we're happy to compile that into a master list and we can push that out to everyone uh, next week if they're interested. And yes, we do have the COVID-19 hub on our website, RPA website. So please uh, reach out and that has a lot of information on, on all of the stuff that we discussed. Great, thank you. Um, people are sharing some of their feedback too about the limitations they've experienced um, with doing only telehealth. Um, for example, the inability to do your analysis um, in physical exams. So obviously topics you all have covered. Um, I wanna check with Rob really quickly, to see if he has any follow-up questions for any of you or any final thoughts you would like to share. Uh, no, I don't. Um, uh, I See, we're two, I think we have two minutes left. You could probably ask another question if there is, Amy. And if not, then I guess we can um, tell everybody thank you and goodbye. I think we're, I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time since we are very tight together today. Um, so I want to thank everyone for their participation in this session. Um, you all have been great. Um, please close the Zoom window and then return to the conference homepage or your email to launch the next talk, which will begin in 11 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.